it used to be that doctors took biochemistry as their undergraduate degree, which is sensible and relevant to understanding the human body. Biochemistry degrees don't require much math or logic, which is critical for understanding scientific method, but it's still very important for health and nutrition topics and for understanding how medicines work. Unfortunately, most doctors today take a pop science undergrad degree in neuroscience before they go to medical school. This has very little actual science in it, and in medical school they really don't learn about the sciences so much as diagnostics, which makes sense because at heart that's what their real job is. But it's really their time as an intern that makes them a bona fide doctor. This is a very difficult process that anyone who is a flake or a cretin is very unlikely to survive. You can be sure almost everyone making it through is a very dependable person who can do a good job at a variety of critical tasks, even in adverse conditions. A lot of people who graduated from medical school but never went through this process have turned to YouTube in recent years because it's actually possible to make more money being a doctor without actually treating patients and just using that doctor title than it is to go into a hospital and do all that hard work. They call themselves doctors, but the only thing they really have to recommend them as scientists is two classes of undergraduate biochemistry. And unfortunately, many of them love to talk about nutrition and promote all kinds of crazy nonsense. Want to know something? I'm a bad doctor. I've never really gotten the hang of the whole healing the sick thing. Neuroscience sounds very important, but this is a degree that was invented in order to make it easier to get into medical school. It is much lighter in hard science than chemistry and biochemistry degrees, and it's full of psychology. Nearly all doctors today take this quote-unquote science degree for their undergraduate study. This is supposed to teach them the basics they need to be a doctor, but it's sadly quite lacking in regards to science. Psychology has never been one of the hard sciences, but in the last few decades it's been exposed that the major research centers have been conducting large-scale fraud. This includes many of the top faculty from schools like Harvard, and this calls into question not only the validity of thousands of research papers, but the entire field itself. Psychology has an important place in science, but it has become not only fraudulent, but also weaponized to push political agendas. This is also where we get the quote-unquote science like the Dunning-Kruger effect. This theory states that people who are less intelligent or less skilled tend to greatly overestimate their abilities, while those who are skilled tend to underestimate them. This sounds like an interesting theory, even though their examples are suspect. For example, they claim a certain criminal who put invisible ink on himself, thinking it would make him invisible, was suffering from this effect. Is this guy stupid though, or is he delusional, or is he simply superstitious? Pretty obviously, he's irrational, and it's one of the latter options, since mere stupidity is seldom this elaborate. The real problem is when you learn how they came up with it, which is by looking at test scores. Those who did well on the test tended to underestimate their scores, while those who did poorly did the opposite. If I think I'll get a 95 on a test, and I'm trying to guess the number beforehand as closely as possible, I'm not going to say 100. I probably won't even say 95, because I want to leave a margin of error in both directions. So I might say 90 or even 85. On the other hand, no one goes into a test planning to fail it or they just don't show up. Maybe you're having a busy semester and are a bit behind. So you study just enough to think you'll get a C on the test and guess your score beforehand at 75. Then you get a zero on the test and you're off by 75 points. I'll leave it to the viewer to take it from there, but I think anyone who can do arithmetic 
can see from the example that this theory is just nonsense. This is the very important stuff our doctors today are learning in college. Stuff that could be debunked by a high school kid. Even before the quack science of neuroscience came into being, they never had any significant training in math and logic they would need to interpret studies for us. Or nutrition for that matter, which is very important to realize, as so many doctors today seem to also think they have a PhD in nutrition somehow. Of course, nutritional science also has many issues, the main one being studies funded by the food industry and special interest groups pushing a plant-based agenda. The journal reviewers and editors all have conflicts of interest, and they also rely on these groups as the main customer for their very expensive journals. Regardless, this is the background that Saladino came from. At the end of the day, his relevant education is that he took a couple of biochemistry classes, but since he calls himself a doctor, even though he can't practice as one, this lends a false air of authority to his words. Sadly, this is enough to get him exposure on all kinds of podcasts and spread his goofy message. I had Popeye's Del Taco. 14,000 calories later, I found myself down at Subway, powering through a 12-inch veggie on whole wheat, battling to cut out a Jared. Our friend Saladino, who I get asked about more than anyone else by far, is right to promote liver as a healthy food. There are a lot of scaremongers who will try to drive you away from liver, but this is misguided. You can eat much more liver than is commonly known, but on the other hand, you should realize that the liver is around 1-2% to of an animal's body weight. Our ancestors ate the whole animal, but only in proportion to what was actually on the animal. They didn't eat hundreds of livers and a couple of ribeyes. There's also a lot of vitamins in liver, but do we really need them? If the bulk of your diet is something other than animal products, then even a small amount of liver can act as a sort of multivitamin. If the liver is grass-fed, it should have plenty of vitamin A, D, E, and K. And these will be in the ratios that you're supposed to get them in nature. So if your diet is not 100% grass-fed, then it also might be smart to eat grass-fed liver weekly or even daily, even if you're a carnivore and get plenty of animal products in your diet. Some people have pointed to liver as a source of vitamin C, but this is not really true. At any rate, it is not more true than muscle meat, and it's less true than other organs, such as the kidney or brain. These have more mitochondria, so you would get more of the animal form of vitamin C in these organs. On the other hand, you probably do not need nearly as much as you may think, as I've gone to, into in other videos. While it has been claimed many times that vitamin A is lethal at surprisingly low doses, in reality, it is only the case for artificially emulsified vitamin A, which damages the liver. Since it's hard on the liver, you should always avoid all emulsifiers if possible, let alone very large amounts. It's been shown by the Price Pottinger Foundation that you can have 10 times as much vitamin A from liver in muscle meat when it comes from unprocessed sources, that is, just meat and organ meat. Keep in mind though, there is no reason to go extremely high with vitamin A. While Saladino promotes eating quite a lot of liver, you don't need these large amounts, especially if your diet is full of animal products. There's plenty of vitamin A in muscle meat, and phosphatidylserine and phosphatidylcholine are actually much higher in the brain and kidney than the liver, which has levels similar to muscle meat. When considering what organs and cuts of meat to eat, the important thing is to look at what our ancestors actually ate and see how deficient we are with our modern diet in comparison. And this is even true looking back a hundred years, let alone a thousand years. That's why I'm always harping on taurine and glycine. We are extremely deficient compared to what our ancestors ate just a hundred years ago. When we look at deficiencies, it makes much more sense to have heart, kidneys, and brains. I'm not going to eat brain anytime soon, but it is chock full of phosphatidylserine and phosphatidylcholine, which are very important and overlooked nutrients, which are very useful in the cell membrane, the nerves, the muscle, and the brain itself, not to mention for athletic performance. 
since the plant-based supplements for these phospholipids are not formed in the same manner, unfortunately you can't get it that way reliably, so it may be worth considering the brain as a nutrition source, though it is in muscle meat and other organs to a much lesser extent. The heart is full of taurine, the bones and skin are full of collagen, and the most important part of collagen is the glycine, and that's plentiful in broth. You also need to have these things every day. So if you're not going to make neck bone soup, oxtail soup, eat lots of seafood daily, and have tons and tons of broth, and eat beef hearts and oxtail soup for the taurine, then you're simply going to be deficient and that's all there is to it. So while liver is a wholesome food, emphasizing it so much is just a gimmick, and that's why I haven't really touched on liver very much in the past. To get whole animal nutrition is difficult today, but it takes much more than just eating some liver from time to time. Unfortunately, the only way to do it requires expensive seafoods, or lots of preparation, or eating all kinds of organs, or simply supplementing it. Since it's usually contaminated with glyphosate in food, and we need a large amount, it makes sense for everyone today to supplement glycine, and supplementing taurine is the only cheap and easy way to get enough. Now the other thing that he promotes heavily is honey, and as time goes by, more and more evidence mounts that the reason we age and the reason we get fat is strongly tied to both glycation and oxidation. Apparently almost no one actually watched my last video, the one on sweeteners, because I said over and over again they're all bad, natural or not, caloric or not, xylitol, saccharin, all of them. I knew that was the case for some time because I'd seen many studies in the past, but when I really looked through them all at once, it was mind-boggling how much information there is that just proves how destructive they are. I could have posted experimental studies all day long that prove very negative outcomes, and there's only the usual short-term or associational studies to counter them, and those are all funded by industry, of course, all the independent research says. They're about the worst thing on the planet. Really, there's absolutely nothing worse than sweeteners, artificial or natural. They all cause oxidation and therefore insulin resistance. They're all bad for the liver. And this is going to lead to bad metabolic health, premature aging and weight gain over time. And the long-term follow-ups on users of sweeteners all bear this out. You're going to get cancer, you're going to get fat, and you're going to die. That's simply all there is to it. You don't want monk fruit, you don't want any of these stupid sweeteners in your diet. And honey is no exception at all, since it's full of fructose, which is going to cause massive levels of metabolic stress on the body. It is also highly glycating, which leads to many of the visible effects of aging, like wrinkles and sagging skin. People can't relate to mitochondrial damage, but they can relate to wrinkles, and it will wrinkle you and make you lose your hair. Saladino claims to have 300 grams of honey per day, and how that's even possible is really beyond me. I always take people's claims about their diet with a grain of salt, but in this case it just beggars belief. If I make a gallon of yogurt, I'll add just one teaspoon of honey for the whole gallon, and the whole thing is sweet. And I like sweet things, but just one whole tablespoon of honey on its own would make me gag, let alone 300 grams. It's also worth noting that Saladino promotes some special mountain-grown honey, and he claims that this is grown above the region sprayed with glyphosate, so you can be sure it's glyphosate-free. Well, you can also be sure that it's dolphin-safe, because all honey is glyphosate-free, unless you actually douse the whole hive in the stuff. The bees are not going to excrete glyphosate into their honey supply and all of the glyphosate is going to accumulate in any collagen in their bodies, not in any honey. <laughs> so there's just no danger of somehow getting glyphosate into the honey supply, so don't worry about that. If you do buy some honey, don't feel you need special magic honey, which is picked by the Irish cousin of Juan Valdez, Clover McFinn. Scotland Yard would love to get their hands on that piece of evidence. Yeah, they're always after me, lucky charms. <laughs> what? 
The fructose in honey will glycate your blood seven times more than glucose. Fructose also causes excessive amounts of free radicals in mitochondria when burned. It combines with the linoleic acid in mitochondria to form melondialdehyde, which is a genotoxin. This leads to mitochondrial damage and death. This drives insulin insensitivity, lowers your basal metabolic rate over time, ages you, and it in short brings you one step closer to death. And in return, what do we get? Just some buzzwords like natural and so on. Nothing tangible. It's not a health food. People want to eat a bit of some special food and become magically healthy and long-lived. In reality, it's avoiding foods that damage you that will have the most effect. It's easy to sell people on sugar because it's sweet and addictive. But while it is technically natural, it is no better than any processed food full of fructose. Many of the people who promote this stuff are hugely biased because they believe in a plant-based agenda for reasons that have nothing to do with health. Others make money off it like Saladino does, and many are simply addicted. I would love to eat sugar all day, but sugar's not a health food. And as time goes by, it becomes more and more clear that everything that's sweet, whether it has calories or not, is ultimately going to damage you and kill you. People talk about moderation, but you have to realize having sugar once a week or once a month is probably a good definition of moderation. Most people don't go out and eat a dessert every day. And even when I was 320 plus pounds, I only ate dessert maybe once a week. The real problem is people like Saladino who promote sugar as normal and a healthy part of the daily diet, even though it never has been in all of human history. Once this kind of eating is normalized, you can rapidly plunge off a dietary cliff into high blood pressure, obesity, and death. I know because I was hanging by my fingernails and about to plunge to my doom when I finally realized that if I keep following the mainstream nutritional and medical advice, I was going to wind up dead. That's when I started fasting, which I think is even more important than diet. That includes eating fewer meals and avoiding snacking. And when you eat fewer meals and lower your carbs, your insulin response is blunted and you have a smaller reactionary spike in cortisol. This helps you break free of your carb addiction because the more you snack and the more bad foods you have, the more this drives up both insulin and cortisol. They'll both be constantly elevated and you'll also be constantly hungry. Psychological addiction is a real phenomenon, but that's not what carb addiction is. It is a very real physiological phenomenon, and the more you indulge, the worse it gets. When you fast, it lets the body reset its hormone levels because you stop stimulating constant hormonal responses from eating. This breaks the addiction, and in time you will be able to safely eat whatever you want, but you really won't want to very much anymore. A low carb diet will do less damage, but you only heal very slowly. When you fast, this is dramatically sped up and it is the only time your immune system fully activates. It's also the only time the body releases large amounts of stem cells. This allows you to heal even organs that otherwise never regenerate much, such as the heart and the brain. It is also critical for both the restoration of the thymus and it's needed by the thymus itself to create T cells, the most critical immune cells of the entire body. People often ask what I eat. I eat a bit of everything, but ultimately it's what you avoid that matters, not what you eat. As time has gone by, I've stripped down more and more garbage from my diet. Packaged foods are out the window, and if I go to a restaurant, I get something akin to meat and two veg. That's the only time I eat vegetables, and if it's high oxalate vegetables or high carb like mashed potatoes, I don't have much or I even just skip it. At home, I often make Italian sausage. It's perfectly healthy and nothing in the world wrong with nitrates or nitrites, in spite of the crazy vegan propaganda about it. I fry them in a pan with a little water and I eat them with some mustard. And whenever they go on sale, I buy up everything they have and I freeze it. I also like to make pork meatballs and tomato sauce. I put Italian seasoning and fennel seed in the sauce and then some Parmesan cheese on top after I take it out. 
I like it and everyone who tries it likes it and the dogs absolutely love it. I also eat bacon and eggs pretty regularly. But the number one thing I like to do is make roast. As time goes by I realize that most of the food we eat is either filler or it's actually harmful. So I always have a roast that I can warm up or I have one going in the crock pot. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C. Crock potting. Always be crock potting. Always be crock potting. I've got a big roasting pan that holds about 25 pounds of meat. I'll get whole briskets when they go on sale. I'll freeze some and roast them up as needed. The prime seasoning from Smith's is great, but it's gotten more expensive and the containers are smaller. Smoked paprika is also quite nice, but you'll have to find out what seasoning works best for you. I put the roasting pan on 275 degrees in the oven and I leave it in there for about 12 hours. And that usually comes out amazingly tender and nice. Sometimes I put it in there a little more afterwards after draining off some fat. Since people often seem to want it spelled out, even though I don't really believe in diet too much, I really believe in fasting and avoiding certain poisonous things in the food supply. But I can give you a little bit of guidance on how to get away from the sad diet and what you should concentrate on. First off, you don't have to eat zero carbs, and I don't. But this is also a good starting place, at least in the planning stage, even if you never eat zero carb in fact, because this is where all the nutrition is. A good starting place for carnivore is to have one pound of 80-20 beef for every 100 pounds of your ideal lean tissue level. So a shorter and more petite woman, you'd eat one pound of ground beef a day and that's it. For a larger man who wanted to be 200 pounds, then it would be two pounds a day. You can play with the fat percentages a bit, but if it's too high, you won't get enough protein. And if it's too low, you'll get constipation. And there's nothing bad about getting too much protein in spite of what many have said. It's important to realize that your body doesn't burn protein based on what you're eating. It burns it based on the hormones in your body, specifically cortisol. The higher your cortisol is, the more protein your body burns. And that's independent of your dietary intake. And if you have trouble eating that level of food, you might want to raise the fat and then I'll make it easier because there's less volume. On the flip side, if you have too little food in your opinion, then you can lower the fat percentage and basically raise the protein and keep the total fat the same. And that'll have a little more uh, heft to it without having more fat in it. But keep track of the fat percentage, not the calories, because the calories and protein do not matter at all. Just keep in mind, there's usually quite a bit of fat in all meat, even if it's so-called lean meat. But ultimately, you want to avoid lean meat anyway, as that's just going to make you constipated. Now, you can do the same thing with any other meat cut or type of meat or even cheese. Just make sure your substitution works out so that you have the same basic ratio of fat to protein. If you want to add in some salad, then have some butter lettuce or a little romaine if you don't have an oxalate problem. You can put cheese and bacon on it too. Just make sure any salad dressing is sour cream dressing or real olive oil and vinegar dressing or yogurt dressing, real yogurt, not bought in the store. If you want to add some less healthy carbs like bread in, then substitute them for a little bit of the fat. Just don't go hog wild and don't allow snacking with carbs as this increases hunger dramatically. It would probably be ideal for health to eat one meal a day if you can manage it, but two meals a day is probably more realistic to get this much food in. And that's with high density animal products. It amazes me how much food some carb addicts eat. They must be eating all day long. As for all those other things that got cut out at the first step, Keep it cut out. No oils, no sweeteners, whether they're natural or not. These are just poisons and you're kidding yourself if you think otherwise. You can have a little Italian cold press olive oil or a little coconut oil once in a while. But otherwise, it all belongs in the garbage because it's highly processed and oxidated and it immediately, instantly damages your liver when you eat it. Always base your diet around meat and other animal products. 
If you try to base it on honey and organ meat or around pasta and bread, controlling your appetite and getting enough actual nutrition is going to be a hopeless task. That's what everyone around you is doing. Just look out the window and see how well it's going for them. Not everyone is obese, but even the ones who aren't are weak, unhealthy, have bad digestion and acne, they're mentally unstable and taking brain pills. And they have 5 million other complaints and are on who knows how many pills for those. If you need to lose weight, a low carb diet will make the pounds come off quickly, at least to a point. If you only have 10 to 20 pounds to lose, it will likely come off in no time. But for large amounts of weight, the weight loss will eventually stop. That's when you need the 36 to 96 hour fast. And that's pretty much the only way for people who are morbidly obese to lose the weight and keep it off permanently. If you don't need to lose weight while fasting, you generally won't. For the frail and the elderly, it tends to put on lean tissue instead. And to fix issues with the stomach, liver, and the gut that will keep you from properly absorbing food, which is why you're getting frail in the first place. When it comes to diet and weight loss gurus, look at their results. The only big influencer I've seen that's helped hundreds of people lose 100 plus pounds and keep it off is Dr. Fung. And he does so mainly through fasting. And the low carb guys also have pretty good success rate, though it's not quite at the level of Dr. Fung. The other guys like Saladino, Liver King, Lane Norton, Greg Doucette, all of these guys love to run their mouths all day, but at the end of the day, they really have no meaningful results to show, not even for themselves. Ultimately, everything is up to you. You have to decide what's best for you and what makes sense to you. And you have to try things until you find the things that work for you and your problems. I'm just here to show you what's worked for me and what people like Dr. Fung and many others have had amazing success with and to try and explain why it works so well as best I can. It's up to all of us to take care of ourselves, but also to kick these false gurus to the curb so they can find employment that suits them better. Tom, why don't you join us at the country club this weekend? <laughs> the country club? Yeah, we're gonna play a quick nine holes of golf and then we're gonna sacrifice Jenkins. <laughs> you know, I think you're on your way up.